Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI 124 Queen Street, Durban. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Auzu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Wal mawizati al hasanati. Wajadil hum billati ahsan. إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين. سورة نحل، chapter sixteen، verse one to five. In this Quranic verse، الله بارك تعالى gives us a method of sharing of propagating his deen. He says، ادعو، invite all. إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom والموعزة الحسنة and with beautiful preaching وجادلهم بالتي أحسن and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious what a beautiful method what a beautiful approach but where are those teachers with these qualifications we hardly see them anywhere in the world with these qualifications that who will go out to go and invite people to the way of Allah without making people feel low, foolish, that we are trying to push things down people's throats, get trying to get willful cooperation from people. Now this method, this wisdom Allah Bari Ta'ala is speaking about, Bil Hikmati, where can this hikmah be found? I say it can be only found in the Kitabul Hikmah, in the Book of Wisdom, which is the Holy Quran. Hikmah by the Al Hakim, the wise, the all wise. Al Hakim, Allah Bari Taala, one of his attributes. In his Kitabul Hikmah, the Book of Wisdom, we will find this wisdom. How Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, how He approaches His creation, and I give you an example that when Allah Bari Ta'ala in the first instance when he was making our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to reason with the pagan mushriks of Makkah the mushriks of Makkah they were saying that God Almighty had Al-Banat, he had daughters Al-Lat, Al-Banat, Al-Uzza that he had daughters these were the moon goddesses they for themselves, they wouldn't like to have daughters. A daughter born in the house was a calamity, is a misfortune. And we know the practice was 
A lot of them, they buried their daughters alive before Islam in the Ayyamul Jahiliya. They, it was a disgrace for somebody to marry their daughters. So, to a people to whom daughters were something worthless, a curse, among such a people, they are now believing that Allah Bari Ta'ala has begotten daughters. So Allah reasons with that mentality. He says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْأُزَّةِ He said, have you seen Allah and Al-Manat and Al-Uzzah? Have you seen them? أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْأُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى And Al-Manat, the third beside. سَأَلَكُمُ الذَّكَرُ وَلَهُ الْأُنْسَى He says, what? Sons for you and daughters for me? تِلْقَ إِذَنْ قِسْمَةٌ These are, it's a very unfair division. You, for yourself, you wouldn't like to have daughters, but you are attributing daughters to me, Allah says, and sons for you, it's very unfair, even according to your pagan standards, your chivalry. This is very unfair that what you don't like yourself, for yourself, you are now giving it to me. Now, on the face of it, it seems that if sons for me, sons for you, no, it doesn't mean that. This is actually Allah reasoning with the pagan mentality. Because when the Christians, they say that Allah has begotten a son, Allah speaks differently. He said, Anna wa takun lahu sahiba. said, how can he have a son when he's got no consort, when he's got no wife? Has he got a mate? Has he got a wife? Now, this is quite different to the way he was reasoning with the pagans. With the Christians, now their mentality is of a different kind, their experience is of a different variety. He said, has Allah got a wife? So they say, no. So then how can he have a son? How can he have a son when he's got no consort, no wife, no companion, no mate? So to each Allah Bari Ta'ala speaks according to his own background and experience. When he speaks to the Jews and the Christians, the Jews and the Christians were boasting that they were a learned people as against the Arabs. The Arabs were barbarians, illiterate, ignorant people. They didn't have a prophet to their credit before the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't have a book to their credit before the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they were looked down upon by the Jews and by the Christians being an ignorant, illiterate people and an illiterate Ummi people and to them comes an Ummi prophet. This was a big joke to them. So Allah Bari Ta'ala he placates the Jews and the Christians in the Holy Quran again and again. And he approaches them according to their own background and experience, their subjective feelings. He says, Ya Halal Kitab, O people of the book, Ya Halal Kitab, again and again, Ya Halal Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'alaw, come, Ila kalimatin sawaim bainana wa bainakum, that we come to common terms as between us and you. Say, Ya Halal Kitab, La taghlu fi dinikum. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, again and again, he's speaking to them in the most respectful manner, the manner in which they would have loved to be addressed as people of the book, people with the scripture, a learned people, that you learned people, come, ta'ala, come, let us get, come to a common platform as between us and you. And he gives us the standards on which we can get together. Then when he speaks to the Jews, the Jews were boasting that we are a chosen people. Allah Bari Ta'ala chose us. And he liberated us from the Egyptian bondage. He gave us shelter of, of clouds in the desert in the Sinai. He gave us manna and salwa in the desert. He gave us 12 springs gushing out in the desert, each one for each tribe. This was their boast. So Allah Bari Ta'ala addresses them. Look, this is the psychology. He addresses them. He says, Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati allati anamtu alaykum. The very thing that they were boasting about. He said, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddaltukum al alameen. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. What was that? It was to guide mankind for his special favors, to guide mankind into the knowledge of God. You see, so he said, I chose you for that, not because of your race, not because of your genetics, not because of your blood, but I chose you for a mission. And he addresses them, that did I not save you from Pharaoh's people? Did I not give you clouds in the desert to shelter you? Did I not say, feed you with manna and salwa and the, the springs that gushed out in the desert for your benefit? 
So this is Allah's way. This is his method of dealing with people according to their different backgrounds and experience, appealing to their subjective reasons and inviting them to his way. Can we do anything better? No. So we in South Africa, Alhamdulillah, we have stumbled across this discovery that there is no better way to speak to the Jews and the Christians than according to their own background and experience, which is this book. Because whenever any type of confrontation is, has arisen with regards to our beliefs or with regards to our rights, the Christian and the Jew keeps on going back to the book. He says, my Bible says this and my Bible says that. We in Islam, we say that sin is not inherited. He says, my Bible says that sin is inherited. We say that Jesus is not God. He says, my Bible says this. We say Christ was not crucified. He says, my Bible says this. So, the environment from which I come, the people are like one book professors. They know this book only. So if we say, my Quran says this, and my Quran says that, I say, my Quran says this, and my Quran says that. So they start attacking the Quran. They start attacking the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They start attacking Islam. I said, rather, let us deal with the claim exactly as Allah Ta'ala tells us to deal with, with hikmah. And with hikmah, he says, he says, when they make the claim, says, And they say that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannat. Illa except man kana hudan av nasara, unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian, Allah says, tilka amani yuhum. This is their wishful thinking, this is their vain desires, this is their hallucination. So, Qul, tell them, ha tu burhanakum. It says, produce your evidence. In kuntum sadiqin, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof that entitles you to Jannah and that destines us to hell, Jahannam. Let us have a look at your proof, your Burhan. And they produced it. They have produced their Burhan, the Bible, in over 2,000 different languages, as at the present moment. More than 2,000 different languages. Among these 2,000 languages, there are 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone, in Arabic. 11 different dialects of Arabic. Uh, I was imagining, as a non-Arab coming from Southern Africa, I was imagining that there was only one Arabic, and the Arabic of the Quran. I didn't know that there was an Egyptian Arabic, there is an Iraqi Arabic, there is a Palestinian Arabic, and there is a Moroccan script, and there is another script, Algerian script, and this script, the 11 different Bibles they produced, they went out of their way to make it easy for the Arab, the Muslim Arab, to respond, to hearken, to the message that he's bringing. So, Allah tells us, Kul hatu burhanakum, he said, produce your evidence. And if proof, evidence is produced, it is the duty of the Muslim to analyze it. Because otherwise it makes no sense. Proof is produced, a book of 2,000 pages, are we gonna swallow it? No. So let us see, what does it say? And wallah, you will find, you will discover, that when you analyze the book, a lot of things that they are claiming, it is not there. So it is your privilege to take up this challenge given by Allah Bari Ta'ala. He says, Qul hatu burhanakum. Tell them, produce your evidence. And when evidence is produced, you analyze it and deal with them, have a dialogue with them. Wa akhirud dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I bring to you peace and salutations from the deepest south of Africa. If you look at the map of the continent of Africa, right down at the bottom end is a country called the Republic of South Africa, where some 400,000 Muslims live. Now, in that country, we Muslims number less than two percent. We Muslims happen to be a minority of a minority in two different groups. A minority of a minority. We are in an ocean of Christianity. 
If the Libyans boast that their country has the highest percentage of Muslims on the continent of Africa, then South Africa boasts the biggest percentage of Christians on the continent of Africa. Now, in that country, we have evolved certain systems and methods of delivering the message of Islam by means of lectures and by literature. And some of the simplest method we have found in lecture form is to invite the non-Muslim, to attract the non-Muslim to our masjids. We have opened our masjids for visitors or tours. This masjid that you see here happens to be in Durban. It is called the Juma Masjid Durban. And on Fridays, we have a congregation of 4,000 Muslims. 4,000 Muslims congregate every Friday in this masjid. We have more than 300 masjids in the country. We have more than 300 madrasas in the country. And we have hundreds of huffas for a population of 400,000. Now, we say here, which we distribute, we say, visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere, largest south of the equator. We are boasting that this masjid happens to be the largest and visit the mosque. And for a free guided tour, we say, phone, our telephone number. And these are one of few things that you can do. You can do one of these few things. Number one, that you phone the offices and make an appointment. Number two, you join a tour organized by a municipality or you write for free Islamic literature. Now, the Durban Corporation of a municipality has put the masjid on its tours, visitors. And they have certain tours, and among them, one is called the Oriental Tour. And in this Oriental Tour, the first port of call is the mosque. From there, they go to the Indian market and they buy some curios and spices and they take them to a hotel some five miles out of town and give them teas and refreshments and they show them the Indian University. But of course, in South Africa, Indian University means the Indian Muslim, the Indian Christian, the Indian Hindu, they all congregate in the same university, the Indian University. And they show them the elite Indian homes. And eventually, they round off the tour by visiting the largest temple, the Hindu temple in South Africa which is in Durban. The city where I come from has the largest mosque, masjid south of the equator, and it also has the largest temple south of the equator. I'm sorry, in South Africa. Now, before they leave for the mosque, they give us a ring, telephone call. They say, look, there are 50 people on the bus. So we go and welcome them. Ahlan wa sahlan. We say, please take off your shoes. And while they're taking off the shoes, we start a conversation. Say, so, do you know why you're taking off your shoes? The answer is always no. Would you like to know? Nobody ever says he doesn't want to know. You see, it's the nature of man. He wants to know why. So he says, you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, so saying we quote from the Bible, which is common to both the Jews and the Christians, because most of these visitors are Jews and Christians. So we quote them from their own holy scripture, their own holy book, saying that God Almighty, he told to Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. We say in respect that of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Because to us, Moses, Hazrat Musa is as much our prophet as Jesus and Muhammad are. We respect them all. We revere them all. So we are fulfilling a commandment as given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. Secondly, before we go in for Salat, we have an arrangement in the Masjid. Our arrangement is quite different from what is in most modern day mosques. We have a pool, a pool of water. And this pool has seats with taps around it. And here is an example of some visitors, tourists, that these visitors and tourists, when they come along, we take a, one of the seats, stand on top of it, and we begin 
We say, allow me, the guide will say, allow me to welcome you all to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. This is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. On your last port of call on the tour, so you will be ending off at a Hindu house of prayer, which is called a temple. A Jewish house of prayer, a church, and a Christian house of prayer, uh, a, a synagogue and a Christian house of prayer, a church. This is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. And allow me to welcome you all with the Islamic salutation of wishing you all Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you all. And we can feel that the non-Muslim, the Jew and the Christian and the atheist and the agnostic in the group, how their hearts respond to the salutation. And we explain about the shoes and we explain about wudu, that before we go into prayer we make ablution, all the exposed parts of the body are being washed, the hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling the mouth, brushing the teeth, this the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year, the one who's particular with his prayers. And purely from the hygienic point of view, no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everyone who nods his head, it is a good hygienic practice. Secondly, it also serves certain psychological purposes, meaning mentally it's preparing the person for prayer. And thirdly, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, the Christian Bible, the Old and the New Testament put together, the Christian Bible, in the second book, called the book of Exodus, it is written. And Moses and Aaron and their sons, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Hazrat Harun alayhi salam, and their sons, washed their hands and the feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet that of a Christian. Yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christians than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. We are not claiming to be an immaculate people, a nation of angels, that we have no black sheep in our midst. We also have our fair share of all the good and the bad to be found in every other religious group. But we say that you will find that the Muslim is more particular in the fulfillment of his religious obligations than any other religious group. And in this regard, we tell our audience, our visitors, that I might as well quote you an American, Bodley by name. He has written a book on the life of Muhammad وسلم, called the prophet of Islam, Muhammad. And in that book he says that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. I mean, people who say that they are Christians, there are more who fill the census form in the world saying that there are Christians than those that say that there are Muslims. That there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. But, he says, but, there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. I say to the visitors, I say that if I said this on my own account, blowing my own trumpet wouldn't have carried much, much weight. It makes me happy to quote an outsider, one of your own men. And with this introduction, we say now we will go into the main house of prayer and I will demonstrate to you all how we Muslims pray. And they come into the main mosque proper and we have them seated against the wall for comfort sitting down on the carpet on the ground which is really an experience of a lifetime for the westerner on the carpet on the ground while seated against the wall they would be facing the Kaaba Makkah and all the masjids in South Africa they are all facing north so we point out there that every mosque in South Africa they face north because Mecca is to the north of South Africa. But if you go to the east, wherever Muslims live, you will find that all the masjids, the mosques are facing west. And from the western countries, they're facing east. And from the northern hemisphere, they're facing south. The attention of the Muslim world converges onto one spot, Mecca, to symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that they have a common direction of prayer. Not that God is there. Because the Holy Quran tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ to Allah belongs the East 
and the West. And whichsoever way ye turn is the presence of Allah. In other words, God Almighty is omnipresent. Whether we look up or whether we look down or whether we look side sideways, He is everywhere. This only symbolizes our unity. Facing in that direction, we say, Allah Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. With folded arms, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate His praises. In the Ruku, which we demonstrate, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, which means glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great. From there, from the Ruku, the semi-bent position, we arise, saying, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, which means Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, it says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ That we are indeed closer to you than your very life veins, the very essence of your being. If our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, if He is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise. Sami Allahu liman hamida. And from that position, we say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. We go into prostration, into sujood, and in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, which means glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker, and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer. And this is also biblical, means this is also according to your Bible. This is also biblical, because this is how all the prophets prayed. Now, when we say all the prophets prayed, to the Westerner, it sounds like a sweeping generalization. But it is not so. I tell them, I remind them, that it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, the Bible, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I quote from the Old Testament. This is actually the Bible of the Jews, which the Christians have inherited. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. I said, I quote from the Old Testament, reading, And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And we read again, And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we learn that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he told them, wait and watch meaning keep guard, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. And fell on his face and prayed to God. So, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the end, I leave it to you, O oh Lord. But I want you to save me. Ya Bari Tala, save me. But as a good Muslim, he submitted his will to the will of God. Muslim. He said, I submit. Whatever you want to do, I'm prepared to go through with it. But I would like you to save me. What did he do? What did he do? He said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. So we ask our audience, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way the Muslim does. Can a circus acrobat do anything better than that? And the mind searches, and there is no answer except this. The only way Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God, means he made the sujood, and Moses and Aaron made the sujood, and Joshua made the sujood, and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam made the sujood. So we Muslims, we are not ashamed to humble ourselves the manner in which the spiritual physicians of mankind, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, May the peace and blessings of God be upon all his messengers. As they did it, we are not ashamed to do likewise. 
Now, the direction of prayer, in the house of prayer, no idols, no images. The only thing really that is worthwhile seeing there is the simplicity of the masjid. But these visitors, when they come, at the back of the mind, when they come, in South Africa especially, because the majority of my people happen to be Hindus, the Indians in South Africa, 80% of them are Hindus. The majority of the Indians, Hindis in India, are Hindus. So the impression that is created is that every Indian is a Hindu, every Hindi is a Hindu. A Hindi doesn't mean a Hindu. Hindi means a man from India, but every Hindu in Hindi is not a Hindu. They don't know. So when they look at me, in the South African context, they say, this guy is an Indian. I can't claim I'm an Arab, I can't say I'm a Turk, though in this environment I might look like one of you. But in South Africa, they recognize me readily as one belonging to the race that is living there. So at the back of the mind, a mosque, a masjid and a temple are synonymous terms. They think these are two different words for the same thing. So when they come into the house of prayer, the Muslim house of prayer, the masjid, always in the group there is somebody asking, where are your gods, meaning your idols and images, your ma'buds, scarfed out, where are they? Because at the back of the mind they were expecting it in the masjid and they don't see it. So he said, look, we have no idols and, idols and images here. So some of them, they still persist. He said, do you only take them out on Fridays? Because they know on Fridays we close our shops for Salat. Between 12 to 2, we close our shops in the country towns, all over. We, every Muslim house of business is closed between 12 to 2 on Fridays. So he says, do you only take out your gods for fresh air on Fridays? He says, no, not even on Fridays. We hate these things. We abhor them. And yet they can't believe because of the back of the mind, every Indian is a Hindu. So we have to explain to these people that Islam is a universal religion. It counts. Its followers, its converts by the millions. The Arab countries as a whole almost are Muslim. They are Christians though, no doubt among them, Arab Christians. But as a whole there are Muslims. Pakistan is predominantly a Muslim country. Nigeria, the majority of them are Muslims. And the Nigerians are not Indians. The Arabs are not Indians. The Turks are not Indians. The Indonesians are not Indians. So in other words, it is a universal religion. And as such, we are able to use the masjid. And we end off by giving these people free literature. Wa akhirud dawanan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon one and all of you. On the 17th of the month of Ramadan, the Muslim month of fasting, we commemorate the event of the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr happened to be the first military confrontation between Islam and Kufr. For 13 years, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he struggled in Mecca, and the Quraysh, the Mushriks, the polytheists of the time, they made things so difficult for him, they planned to assassinate him, and he was forced to flee from Mecca to Medina, which we call the Hijra, from which the Muslim era dates. But in Medina, they didn't give him peace. They were prepared and they were preparing to go out with an expedition, the Mushriks of Mecca, to wipe out Islam and the Muslims. And when they marched on to Medina, when the news reached the Prophet of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came out to meet this opposition some 313 ill-equipped Muslims, young and old, they came out to meet these mushriks who had coming along to attack Medina. Instead of staying at home and allowing 
the mushriks to invade Medina and kill men, women, and children, young and old. So they came out, and at a place called Badar, the Muslims encamped and waited, and a battle took place between 313 Muslims and a thousand mushriks. And Allah Ta'ala, with his help, he gave the Muslims the first military success, which decided almost for all times the superiority of Islam, the success of Islam. But from this event and the successive defensive battles that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, fought at Uhad, at Khandak, successive defensive battles, the protagonists in the West, they have labeled Islam a religion of the sword. They have attacked the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, by saying that he spread his religion at the point of the sword. In other words, he forced people to accept Islam. Now, history gives a lie to this. And this myth of Islam being spread at the point of the sword has been exploded a hundred times over. But it's a type of sickness that has possessed the West. They can't seem to leave this. They can't seem to let go of the sword and Islam being synonymous things. Now, the Holy Quran tells us that like Rafid Deen, that there is no compulsion in religion, even if the Muslims were in a position to force people to embrace Islam, either through physical force or economic force, this is disqualified. Because Allah says, there is no compulsion in religion. And if you compel a person at the point of the gun, or at the point of a, of a sword or a dagger, to say the kalima, the creed of Islam, it is absolutely worthless. So, Islam forbids, and the Muslim history also proves that they did, no doubt, spread themselves throughout the world with this Quran in one hand and the sword in the other, but they did not offer the Quran as an alternative to the sword. They went and conquered the early history of Islam, they swept through North Africa, they went into Spain, and they ruled Spain for 800 years. Now, history tells a lie to this charge of Islam being spread at the point of the sword. Because after 800 years, the Muslims were thrown out of Spain to a man. After 800 years of Muslim rule, there was not a single Muslim left in that country to give the Azan. The reason is obvious because they did not convert the Spanish people at the point of the sword. Had they done it, 800 years, economically they were in power, they could have forced the Spaniards, economically, politically, educational system, everything was in the hands of the Muslims. And 800 years is a mighty long time to convert a nation to change a people. They could all have been converted, and the Muslims would have never left Spain. But they did not do any such thing. They did not force Islam down anybody's throats. Then we come to Cyprus in the Mediterranean. Our Turkish brethren ruled that island for 400 years. And after 400 years of Turkish rule, we find that the Greeks are still in the majority. Had they forced Islam down the, the throats of the Greeks, there would not be a single Greek on Cyprus today. Coming to India, my own motherland, Hind, the Muslims ruled that country for a thousand years. And after a thousand years of Muslim rule, eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Simply because the Muslims did not force Islam down people's throats at the point of the sword. Then we have countries far in the Pacific, one of the most populated Muslim nations in the world, we say Indonesia. In Indonesia, over a, thousand, over a hundred million Muslims but history tells us that not a single Muslim soldier landed in that country. Malaysia, almost as a whole Muslim, not a single Muslim soldier landed there. West Africa, look at Nigeria. The bulk of the people of Nigeria are Muslims. Not a single Muslim soldier landed there. On the east coast, Zanzibar, which Muslim armies invaded Zanzibar. Tanganyika, Tanzania. And further down to the southmost, 
the Muslims reached as far as Mozambique. Mozambique, some 500 years ago, was a Muslim possession. The Arab trader had been, had gone there as far as Mozambique. And there was a Muslim governor of this area, some 500 years ago, whose name was Musa bin Baik. And when the Portuguese, when they conquered this territory, they could not pronounce Musa bin Baik, so they said Mozambique. They changed the name, they perverted the name to Mozambique, maybe unintentionally, but they perverted the name. Like Gibraltar, it was Jabal Tariq, the Mount of Tariq. They couldn't say Jabal Tariq, so they said Gibraltar. So history tells us that the Muslims, whether in Spain or in Cyprus or in India or in the Far East, nowhere, I mean an individual Muslim might have, some ruler might have forced an individual here and an individual there, or a dozen here or a dozen there. But as a people, as a whole, the Muslims have been meticulously following the Quranic injunction. Like Rafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. And in the history of early Islam, we find the same situation. The Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he did not force a single individual, whether Jew or Christian or pagan, to Islam by force. So Islam is today, even today, the history tells us that today uh, Islam is spreading. There is a sword, but this sword is the sword of the intellect. In the West, in England, in America, in my own country, South Africa, where I come from, Islam is spreading among the Indian, the other Indian, who are majority of them are Hindus. The Indian Hindu is coming towards Islam. The Christian colored, a mixture between white and black, is coming towards Islam. The white man, Christian and Jew, is coming towards Islam. And we are a minority of a minority. We are, the Muslims of South Africa, less than 2% of the population. What force can we exert except the force of the intellect, reason, logic, and the, the propagation, the tilawat e quran the argument from the Holy Quran? So, the defense of Islam, the Muslims, no doubt, they had to defend themselves by arms. And this is something natural. Gibbon, the master historian, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he says that every individual, every human being has a right to defend himself and his person and his position. And to extend his hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation, which the early Muslims were forced to do. Then Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, he defends the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and Islam and the Muslims. Some in 1840, this great thinker in England, he delivered a series of talks on heroes and hero worship. And among his hero as prophet, he chose the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, And regarding this charge of forcing Islam down people's throats, he says, the sword indeed, the sword indeed, but where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. There's only one man. It is one man against all men that he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. He said, first, you must get your sword. In other words, no sword was ever used by the prophet of Islam or his successors to propagate the faith. May this dispel this myth once more again. Wa akhiru dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Subhana allazi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير صدق الله صدق الله المولى العظيم My dear brethren I have read to you the first verse of Surah Bani Israel which is the 17th chapter of the Holy Quran You may refer to this in the Holy Quran I mentioned once before published 
by the Islamic, by the, uh, the Islamic courts and affairs of your own city, Doha, Qatar. And this Quran is available from them. It's a translation, an encyclopedia of some 2,000 pages, which has a very comprehensive index. Now, in this index, you'll find details of the Mi'raj under M, or if somebody tells you that this is in the Surah Bani Israel, you look under B, Bani Israel, and it'll tell you that Bani Israel is chapter 17, and you can very, very readily, very easily check up and read for yourselves with the commentary that is given in it. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this event which took place in the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Mi'raj, meaning the ascension, in which the Holy Prophet Muhammad was taken, according to the majority of the commentators, with whom I agree, that physically he was transported from the Masjid al-Haram, that is, the Masjid at Makkah, the holy mosque, the sacred mosque in Makkah. From there, he was transported to the farthest mosque, which was in Baytul Muqaddis, that is Jerusalem. And from there, he was transported into the spiritual realms physically. Now, the difficulty with uh, many Muslims about Miraj is whether it was spiritual or whether it was physical. No doubt, in Islamic tradition, uh, we read of a number of experiences that our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had in what is called Asra or being taken up, Isra, Miraj. But this one in particular, the commentators say that it was physical. Now, what is the difficulty? The difficulty is for modern man, he says, now how can anybody be taken out into outer space and into the great beyonds, because we know that as we go higher and higher, there is lack of oxygen and uh, freezing. One would freeze to death. If we go to a place like, let's say, the moon, they say on the sunny side of the moon, where we see the bright brightness, where the sun is shining, it is so hot that the humankind, his body, his blood will boil in two minutes. On the shaded side, he will freeze in the same amount of time. So how can anybody be taken out of this environment into another environment and be brought back safe and sound? Well, giving some little thought to this, I find that there are so many things which to the layman is impossible to comprehend. For example, our own movement on earth. We are told by learned men, science, men of science, geographers, astronomers, that we are at the present moment, I myself included, while seated here so comfortably, am being rotated, that this earth is rotating, and we, all of us on it, are rotating at a speed of a thousand miles an hour. The circumference of the earth being 24,000, and once in 24 hours we make one complete revolution. So we are traveling while seated comfortably at a thousand miles an hour in one direction, rotation, thousand miles an hour. Everything is being taken for a ride, thousand miles an hour. But this is one movement. There is another secondary movement that while the earth is rotating, the earth is going around the sun. And we are told that the speed at which it is moving around the sun in an elliptical orbit is 66,000 miles an hour, which goes round and round while rotating, going round and round the sun in 365 and a quarter day, 365 and a quarter. 66,000 miles an hour in a forward direction and 1,000 miles an hour in a rotary motion. Now, if we tell this to the layman, that he is making two movements, one of 1,000 miles an hour and another at 66,000 miles an hour, he'll laugh at you. He will laugh at us. He says, look, man, what are you talking about? I can see I'm on terra firma, solid earth. How come that you are telling me that we are moving? And at such a, a stupendous speed, at 60 miles an hour in a motor car, at 100 miles an hour in a motor car, we know how uncomfortable we feel. 
And how is it that at that stupendous speed, no movement is perceptible even? So, the answer is in this, that for God Almighty, He has protected us through this atmosphere, forces of gravity, and we are being taken around in comfort and in ease without even perceiving any movement. Leave out 1,000 miles or 66,000 miles, no movement at all. We feel as if we are remaining fixed in space somewhere. And it is the sun that is going round and round and round, whereas in actual fact it is we who are going round and round and round. So, if God Almighty can protect us in so easily, so comfortably, if He wants to transport His servant from place to place, in a capsule of His making, what is impossible for Him? He has the power to do what He wills. And today, we are having science fiction, and in science fiction, they are showing us in my own country, there is a series of programs, they call them Star Trek, invent, uh, they programmed in America, Star Trek, in which they show us that how spaceships are going around in the universe and uh, that man is being uh, transported, he is being changed from one form into another, from, one, one, uh, from the spaceship onto some planet and from the planet back to uh, the spaceship and uh, as if he is being disintegrated in front of your eyes and taken from place to place. Now, this idea that man can be transported, it is possible, maybe in a hundred years time, in a thousand years time, whatever the mind of man, he has been able to conceive and perceive so far, he has been able to do. Ten years before the first man landed on the moon, Kennedy, he proclaimed to the American public, that within the next 10 years, we will land on the moon. And he did it. Then, we have been talking about Mars and Jupiter probes, and they are making probes. They are going, they are sending the spaceships, they are sending the satellites, and they are coming back with information. So, if man can do that today, by knowing about what is in the heavens, if it is easy for him, we say, the Muslim, the man of faith, he says, if my Lord says that he can do something for his prophet, his chosen messenger, it is nothing difficult for him. So, we believe, the Muslims as a whole, we believe in the ascensions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam that Allah bari ta'ala took him up and the experience which he had. He gave us those experiences, he narrated them to us and in this experience, one of the greatest gift he brought for the Muslim was Salat. Salat became fard upon the Muslim. And we hear in Islamic tradition that from 50 times a day, gradually it was reduced to 5 times a day. And Salat has been described alternatively as as salatu mi'rajul mu'mineen, that Salat is the miraj, the ascension of the mu'min. So, here is a blessing for us in this miraj, this event, which we can remind ourselves. And 5 times a day, every day of the year, we can communicate with the Lord and created that nearness, that awareness, that when we stand in His presence, we can stand, as the Prophet said, tarahu, as if thou seest Him, that though you see Him not, He sees you, and this is the miraj of the Muslim. May Allah bari ta'ala make you and all, all of us, you know, benefit from this spiritual experience of the Prophet sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, it was the 27th of the month of Ramadan that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was in a cave some three miles north of the city of Makkah in ghar e hira subsequently to be known as Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light. He was in this cave 
And on that night, the angel of God comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, in Arabic. Iqra, which means read, or proclaim, or recite. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, being unlearned, naturally he responds, he says, Ma ana He said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra, meaning again, read, or recite, or rehearse. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, again pleads with the angel in terror. He says, Ma ana He said, I'm not learned. For the third time, the angel of God embraces him hard, and says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created. Now the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam, he grasps that what was required for him to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word, Iqra, means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. So he repeated. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created. So khalaq al insana min alaq. Say, he who created man from a mere clot of congealed blood. So he says, Khalaq al-insana min alak. Say, ikra wa rabbuk al-akram. He says, read, and the Lord is most bountiful. And he says, ikra wa rabbuk al-akram. Say, alladhi allama bil kalam. Says, he who taught the use of the pen. So he says, alladhi allama bil kalam. Say, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. He says, taught man that which he knew not. And he says, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. These were the first five verses that were revealed to our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that Ghari Hira. Immediately the angel disappeared. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, shivering all over, sweating, he runs home some three miles south to Mecca and to his dear wife Ummul Mu'mineen Khadijatul Kubra and he says, cover me up, cover me up. And she covered him up. When he got out of his excitement, he explained to her what he had seen and what he had heard. Because those words made indelible impression on his heart and mind. He could never let go. They were, so to say, like grooved into his mind. And he feared that what had happened was that something has gone wrong with him. We talk about other people, he said, who go mad, who are possessed, and perhaps something similar has happened to me. Our mother, Ummul Mu'mineen Khadija al Kubra, she assures him that Allah will not allow such a thing to happen to him. And she takes him to her cousin Waraka, who had learned the scripture of the Jews and the Christians, and she, he assured him that Allah has chosen him as a prophet, and if he were alive, this man was blind, Waraka, that if he were alive, you know, when trouble came, he would be very happy to help him in his mission. Now, question arises. Where did the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get these words from? Where they're coming out of his own mind, his subjective mind, his own thoughts and imaginations? Now, I have had fortune, the, good, uh, the good fortune, the opportunity of speaking this subject to psychologists. And again and again the psychologists, they say they can't account for this wahi. Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he's not talk talking about the problems of his people. There were problems. The problem of his people was that they were drunkards, they were adulterers, they were gamblers, there was fratricidal wars over little, little things. They were fighting and killing one another for decades. That given the master historian truly described the Arabs before Islam, the Arabs of Ayyamul Jahiliya, he said, the human brute, meaning the animal in human form. The human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing human about them was the form. Otherwise, in their ethics, in their morality, in their behavior, they were worse than animals. The Arabs of Ayyamul Jahiliya. So this was his problem. And instead of talking about his problem, he is made to utter about speaking about, reading, about writing and about learning things unknown before. How do you account for it? Psychologists fail. Now this wahi, the first revelation, the experience that our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had and that he went and ran home to his dear wife Umul Mu'minin Khadija Al-Kubra are not the narrations of an imposter. If a man impostures, 
a position, if he, an imposter comes along and he says, I'm a prophet, God has chosen me, then he does not talk about how terrified he was, how he sweated, and how he ran home to his wife, which is the most shameful thing for an Arab to say today, that he ran home to his wife for help and support. And it would be more shameful 1400 years ago to tell his people that I ran home to my dear wife. Now, this is not the behavior of an imposter. Imposters don't behave like that. Because imposters, they would like to make it known that they are somebody great. That Jibreel, Jibreel came to me, an imposter would talk something like this. And I told him, you better bring God down from his throne. I want to talk to have a, to have a personal chat with him, face to face. As Moses spoke to him, I want to speak to him, bring him down. And God came down from his arsh, and he sat with me, and we had a heart-to-heart -heart chat, and so on and so on. This is how imposters talk. But this again is a fulfillment, is a fulfillment of a prophecy, of a basharat, from the previous scriptures, from the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. In this book called the Bible, what the Christians and the Jews hold dear, the Old Testament portion of it, in it there is a book called the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 29, verse 12, there is a prophecy which reads, it says, and the book, book meaning the revelation of God, not literally in this form here, as we see the Holy Quran in this form, not in this form, but the book means the revelation of God, like Allah says, ذلك الكتاب, this is the book, but there was no book in this form, it is the revelation, the wahi. It says, and the book is given to him that is not learned. I'm quoting. I'm quoting word for word from the scripture. So, and the book is given to him that is not learned. And Ummi, saying, read. And he saith, I am not learned. In other words, I'm not educated. How can I read when I'm not learned? Now, there is not another occasion in the life experience of any prophet in the Bible, and hundreds of prophets are mentioned in the Bible, including Hazrat Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament is mentioned by name. Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam, they call him John the Baptist, is mentioned in the book. No Isa or Musa or Dawood or Suleiman or Yahya or Ilyas, not one prophet in this whole vast volume of the Bible, not one prophet we ever find these words escaping his lips that I am not learned, that I am not learned. Jesus didn't say that I am not learned. Yahya didn't say that I am not learned. But this we find fulfilled in the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, that he is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the words of Hazrat Musa salam, he prophesied the coming of our Nabi Karim wasallam. In the words of Hazrat Isa salam, Jesus Christ, he also prophesied the coming of our Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And it is the duty of the Muslim to look up these verses and master these verses and share them with their fellow countrymen, the Christians who live in our midst, the Christians in the Lebanon, the Christians in Egypt, and the Christians throughout the world, people, our fellow workers, our co-workers, our employees. It is our duty to share this knowledge, this basharat, this fulfillment of prophecy with them, with the Jews, and the Christians. And this is the primary duty of the Muslims, and it is about time that we did this job, which we have been neglecting for the past 1400 years. <laughs>
Newcastle is a city in England where coal is mined. And it would be a strange thing for people to export coal to Newcastle. But the question is, the riddle is, what is stranger than that? And a modern answer to that riddle is sending oil to Arabia, meaning to the Arab countries. It's stranger than sending coal to Newcastle. Now, I, as a Muslim from the southmost tip of Africa, nearest to the South Pole, I am coming here to Arab lands, to Muslims who were originally where Islam started from, and I am coming to tell them something about Ramadan. And in telling them so, I have quoted a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Al-Baqarah, that is chapter 2, verse 185. For the non-Muslims watching this program, how can they have access to such a verse? The first method is, that you ask any Muslim and if he tells you about a surah, surah meaning chapter, and he says, Baqarah, in this volume, which was presented to me by the Presidency of Islamic Courts and Affairs in your city of Doha, Qatar, in this volume of a translation of the Holy Quran, if you open the index, right at the back end of this volume is an index under B, you will find Baqarah and if you look up, Baqarah means chapter 2. So you open chapter 2, you get to verse 185 and you will get this verse about Ramadan, the month of fasting. It says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi undila fihi al-Quran. Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. Hudal lin nasi, in it is guidance for mankind, not only for the Arabs, not only for the Indonesians, not only for the Pakistanis, but for the whole of mankind. Hudal lin nasi wa bayinatim min al huda wal furqan. And it is a fuller explanation of the, the revelation of God and a guidance and as a discrimination, as a standard of judging right from wrong. This is the Quran, the final revelation of God Almighty to mankind. So, month, Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. And two verses before this one, in verse 183, we are told, Ya yuhalladhin amanu, say, O you who believe, O men of faith, Ya yuhalladhin amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu, kama kutiba alaylladhin min qablikum. Says, fasting has been ordained for you, has been prescribed for you, as it, is, as it had been prescribed for those before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That ye may learn self-restraint. That ye may learn discipline. The purpose of fasting, we find here, told to us by God Almighty, is not just to starve ourselves, but that we may learn self-discipline. And there is nothing new in this. It is not entirely something novel that God Almighty had ordained this system of fasting for the previous religious systems. In Judaism, the, the religion as taught by Moses, fasting was prescribed. In the religion as preached by Jesus Christ, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, fasting was prescribed. And we read in the Christian scriptures, in what is called the New Testament in English, that Jesus Christ, he told his disciples that when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. They do not wash their faces and they do not brush their hair. But when you fast, you must wash your face and brush your hair of a happy countenance that nobody knows that you are fasting because you are fasting for the love of God. So in Islam, this is one of the major principles, pillars of Islam. And the Muslim, he looks forward to this holy month of Ramadan. And the Ramadan of the Muslim, the holy month of fasting, is counted according to a lunar calendar. We in the West, people in the West, we have a Gregorian solar calendar based on the movement of the sun, 365 and a quarter day, a year, and another 365 and a quarter, and another 365 and a quarter, and at the fourth turn of the earth around the sun, they add a day. 
which means they have a lunar, they have add what is called in February, they add an extra day. Now, in Islam, Allah Ta'ala, God in His mercy, what He has done is that by giving us a lunar calendar for working out our days and our counting for our religious festivals, it has made it possible for mankind to have a fair chance of experiencing all the seasons of the year. For example, that if it was a solar calendar, then in the West, for example in England, which is a Western country, not of the southern, of the, equate, of the equator, in that if Ramadan was around Christmas time, in December, like they say the birth of Jesus Christ was in December, they have a white Christmas, means always it is midwinter. In our case, if Ramadan was to come, instead of December, we say Ramadan, then every year, year in and year out, it would have been a, a midwinter for fasting, and people in the south of the equator, it would have been in midsummer, like in my country, South Africa, we would be having midsummer throughout our experience, and the Western man would be having midwinter throughout his experience, and fasting in winter and fasting in summer are not equal. There is a vast difference between these two. Fasting in summer is no doubt more strenuous, it is more tiring, more trying than fasting in winter. Then in winter, in the West, they have very, very long days and very, very short nights. Then we have very, very long days and uh, very short days in, in winter and very, very long nights. So in other words, it would be very unfair, very unjust to work on a system of that nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, in His wisdom, in His mercy, He has given us this lunar calendar for working out this holy month of Ramadan. And we Muslims, we fast from before sunrise to sunset, before dawn, we can have a little breakfast, and the whole day, from, morning, from, from, from sunrise up to sunset, not even a sip of water, no smoking, no sniffing, and other normal relationship which might exist between, let's say, the husband and the wife. Even those relationships of uh, satisfying your sexual needs are forbidden. And it is a great discipline. And the only witness to this system of fasting is God Almighty Himself and we are told in the books of Hadith that Allah Bari Ta'ala, He Himself will reward the faithful, the one who has fasted from His own presence because the Muslim has done this for the love of God only and nobody is a witness to this because in the privacy of one's own home, from the cool refrigerator, he can take out water and he can drink. Who is a witness to that? Nobody except Allah. So with the fear of Allah, the love of Allah, this makes the Muslim to obey this pillar of Islam. وَآخِرُ الدَّوَانَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحج أشهر معلومات فمن فرض فيهن الحج فلا رفث ولا فثوك ولا جدال في الحج صدق الله صدق الله نور النظيم My dear brothers and sisters I have read to you a verse from the Holy Quran from chapter 2 verse 185 in which Allah tells us about Hajj that for Hajj the months are well known you know the months of Hajj and when Hajj the season of Hajj comes along when one undertakes Hajj it is the duty of the haji, the person who performs hajj, that there is no obscenity, that he performs no obscenity, he doesn't do anything that is outward, untoward, and nor does he do anything wicked, nor does he do any wrangling, 
during the period of Hajj. Now in the Hajj, there are certain signs of Allah Bari Ta'ala, certain duties that one has to perform. And among these duties of Hajj, one is Sa'i, that is running between Safa and Marwa. These were originally two hillocks, two small hills. And the history goes that Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Holy Prophet Abraham, the father of the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, everybody reveres this messenger of God as Father Abraham, Father Abraham, Father Abraham. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. And through a conflict that existed between these two wives of his, Allah Bari Ta'ala commanded him to take Hajra with her infant child Ismail and take him to where Makkah is today and leave mother and child. Outwardly, it was one of the most cruel of deeds that any man can do to his wife and child. A young wife and an infant child. But at the behest of Allah, he was prepared to do anything what Allah commanded him. He was prepared to carry out the commandments of Allah. So he leaves mother and child. And as time wore on, they ran short of water. And Bibi Hajra, she began searching for water, looking in this direction, looking in that direction, running up on top of Safa, looking around to see for some oasis or see some habitation, nothing to be seen. She runs down the hillock and runs up onto the opposite hillock, Marwa, and she scans around for some sign of habitation, some oasis, some habitation, some people, and she finds nothing. And she runs up and down and down and up seven times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took such a liking to this compassion, this love that she had for her infant child that he made it firm upon the haji the man who goes on pilgrimage, that he must also go, go through the same process of up and down seven times. Now Allah had a purpose in this, of making us to go through that. As a discipline, as a sign, as a monument of remembering Allah. Then he made Ibrahim, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, to build the Kaaba. Hazrat Ibrahim and his son, inf uh, young man, when is Ismail grew up, to say, of age of discretion, about 12 years of age, him, father and son, they began raising the walls of the Kaaba. A, a cubicle, a square building, plain and simple building, dedicated to the worship of the one true God. We say it was the first house built on God's good earth for the worship of the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was made to shout, to give the call, for people to hearken to the call, to come along and do tawaf around this house of God, to show his love and dedication. And when the Muslim performs Hajj, he goes around the Kaaba seven times, the tawaf seven times, and as he walks around the Kaaba, he is made to proclaim the talbiya. The reminder, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, means here I am, O Lord, here I am, O Allah, here I am, labbaik, here I am, la sharika laka labbaik, you have no associates, here I am. Innal hamda, says to you is due all praise, wa ni'mata, and all beneficence, all bounties proceed from thee, laka wal mulk, and yours is the dominion, yours is the power, yours is the rule. La sharika lak, and you have no associates. Now this is the slogan, 1400 years old. And this year, some 3 million hajis, they went through that ritual of going around the Kaaba seven times, making the tawaf, and repeating this formula. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. Now, I was very fortunate this year in performing this ritual. And while going through, it struck me 
that this slogan, it is a slogan, talbiya, a reminder, a slogan, that which we Muslims are made to repeat year in and year out, no change, given by our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no change. There must be a purpose in this slogan. And I found that slogans are made to be repeated and implemented. The United Nations, they have the certain agencies. And in certain of these agencies, they work for certain projects. And they invent slogans. Like, for example, they had water year. Water year. Year of the water for saving, conserving water. And in that water year, the slogan went out, use it, don't abuse it. Water, use it, don't abuse it. Which is really our own slogan 1400 years old also. But now, the slogan part, that people from all over the world are invited and they go through this process of having themselves programmed. They imbibe themselves with these slogans and they go to their own respective countries and they propagate the slogan and the idea. Or this is the age of the child. This is the age of the child. This is an age for old aged people. So it says, your mother, you know, an old age home is not her destination. You know, you must look after your parents and on and on. These are really to me Islamic slogans which the United Nations in some form or another under novel names they try to implement it. And these slogans are carried out in all parts of the world in different countries. But this slogan that we Muslims are repeating year in and year out. The most unfor unfortunate part is this, that we have done nothing. We are doing nothing to take them back home into our own respective countries. We leave the slogan behind. No doubt we take the dates from Makkah and Medina and we buy all the trinkets from Makkah and Medina. Things are very cheap. But the main purpose of Hajj which is to see that this slogan is implemented, to see the shirk is obliterated from the face of the earth, this, unfortunately, we Muslims have forgotten this lesson to imbibe. Wa akhiru dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon one and all. In the Holy Quran, in Surah Muhammad, I am quoting from Surah Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa in tatawallaw yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. This is the last segment of the last verse of Surah Muhammad, chapter 47. If you were to find this in the, your Holy Quran, to the Arab there is no difficulty. Most probably he knows and he can open and find it. But for the non-Arab and more especially the non-Muslim, he will have to get a book like this. The Holy Quran translated an encyclopedia of some 2,000 pages produced by the, uh, the, the, the presidents of the Islamic courts and affairs in Doha, Qatar. You can obtain this from them. And at the back of this volume is an index. And in that index, if somebody told you that this is from Surah Muhammad, so you look up under M. Muhammad in italics and it will tell, tell you chapter 47. Or somebody tells you chapter 47, then it is easy to find chapter 47. And verse 38, the last verse. I have quoted to you the last segment of the last verse from this Surah Muhammad, in which Allah says, That if you turn back, O you Muslims, if you turn back, if you turn back from the duties and responsibilities which Allah Bari Ta'ala has imposed upon you for being the khaira ummat in the best of people, if you turn back from your duties and responsibilities, it says, Yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Summa. Then, la yakunu amsalakum. Then they will not be like you. And when we study history, 
we find that, that this law and eternal law of Allah Ta'ala is working all the time. You do not carry out your duties and responsibilities, Allah replaces you with another people. And in this history, we have a classic example of the Bani Israel. Let us confess that Allah chose them. As much as we might not like it, for racial reasons, for what is happening in the Middle East, what is happening in Israel, what is happening to our brethren, we don't like it. But Allah chose them. And He sent prophets after prophets to them. Out of the four books that we name, that we believe in, we say the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil, and the Furqan. Out of the four, three are those given to the Jews. The first one to Hazrat Musa, the second one to Hazrat Dawud, the third one to Hazrat Isa, Torah, Zabur, Injil, Jew, Jew, Jew. Among all the prophets we name, besides the, our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, almost all the other names we take, we say Hazrat Musa Alayhi Salaam, a Jew, Hazrat Dawud Alayhi Salaam, a Jew, Hazrat Suleiman Alayhi Salaam, a Jew, Hazrat Yahya Alayhi Salaam, a Jew, Hazrat Isa Alayhi Salaam, a Jew. Look, Allah chose them for His revelation to become the torch bearers of light and learning to the world. But they made their religion a racial religion. They were not prepared to share with anybody. They made it a family tradition. The Deenullah, they made it a family affair. Only for Jews. So Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, a Jew among the Jews, he tells them, as recorded in the so-called Injil, because the, in the Christian Bible, as I said, divided into two portions, the Old and the New Testament. The New Testament is what they call the Gospel, the New Testament, the, in which we have a certain number of books. We, they say the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the Gospel according to St. Mark, the Gospel according to St. Luke, the Gospel according to St. John. And they translate this word Gospel in Arabic as Injil, Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile uh, Lucas, Injile Johanna. They keep on repeating the word Injil, 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 which may be a correct translation, but really this is not Injil. When we say Injil, we believe in the revelation that Allah Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. That is Injil, not what Matthew wrote or what Mark wrote or what Luke wrote or what John wrote. These are not Injils. You can call it the so-called Injils. But the Injil is what was given to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said to his people, the Jews. He said, and the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Because you are not doing the job, you have made your religion a racial religion. Allah Bari Ta'ala will take this honor, this privilege of being the Khaira Ummatin. They were the Khaira Ummatin of their time. But because they didn't do the job, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam says, it will be taken away from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's going to produce results. And this is the law of God. If you don't produce results, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا خَيْرَكُمْ He says, he'll substitute in your place another people. So he substituted in place of the Bani Israel, the Bani Ismail, the Arabs. And a people, they were looked down upon. And this is the law of God again. He picks up the people whom the world considers to be the most despicable, the most lowly, he takes them up from the gutter and he puts them on the top. He makes them masters of the world. He makes them rulers of the world. And he has done it again and again. He honored the Muslims. They spread out throughout the known world. They conquered North Africa. And they went to Spain. And they ruled Spain for 800 years. They had a, a jolly good time. Riches, opulence, buildings, amenities of life. As Allah describes, Kam tarakum in jannatim wa uyun. So how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazuim wa makam in kareem. And cornfields and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fiha faqihin. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Thus other people were made to, in, to inherit these things. 
and neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. 800 years they had a jolly good time, our ancestors in Spain. But they didn't propagate the faith. They didn't do the primary duty of the Muslim was to propagate the faith. faith. The deenullah, this is what Allah honored him for. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas. When he made us the best of people for mankind, it was for mankind and not for the Arabs alone or the North Africans alone. But they made it also like the Jews. They made it a closed book. They were not prepared to share the deen with the Spaniards. So these drunkards. These gamblers, these pig eaters, what will they understand about Islam? So they didn't do the job. So Allah's law comes into force. And they will substitute in your place another people. And they were substituted. Kicked out to a man. There was not a single Arab left. There was not a single Muslim left in that country after 800 years to give the azan. Shame on us. In Cyprus, in the Mediterranean, our Turkish brethren, they ruled that country for 400 years. And in 400 years, they didn't convert 400 Greek families to Islam. Had it not been for the strong arm of Turkey protecting these Turks in Cyprus, there would not be a single Turk left on that island today. Without Turkey, no Turk on Cyprus. Wiped out to a man, not one will be left. This is Allah's law. Yastabdil qawman khayrakum. If you are not prepared to share, this is the outcome. In India, the Muslims ruled that country for 1,000 years. But after 1,000 years of Muslim rule, eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Why? Because the Muslim didn't do the job. 1,000 years he failed to do the job. So the law of Allah comes again into force. Yastabdil qawman khayrakum. He'll substitute in your place another people. It's a warning for us. Allah has given us a second inning in the Arab lands. He has given you a second inning. And I believe that there will not be a third inning. Either we fulfill the duties and obligations which this honor of being the Khaira Ummatin imposes upon us, or, or wait. Fatar Abbasu, Allah says wait. And the people in the past, they waited for the destruction. Are we going to wait? It's left to us. يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالَكُمْ صدق الله صدق الله مرة نزيم Adjoining the Juma Masjid Durban are the offices of the Islamic Propagation Center International. The center began its modest activities in 1958, over 25 years ago with one dingy office. In time, the center was forced to acquire two more offices. Now, with warehouses facilities in three different places, it is finding all its facilities still inadequate. The Poor Bandar Madrasa Trust, a charitable organization, has taken pity on our plight and has set in motion a plan to build a quarter million rand project in the mosque square, next to the Juma Masjid itself. From printing and publishing pamphlets and booklets on Islam, the Islamic Propagation Center has reached the 100,000 target for each of its publications as a first print. From booklets and cassette tapes, the center has now ventured into the video field. The center can boast a unique distinction of offering more than 20 different video programs on Islam. Which sad to say, no Muslim country in the world can offer. Subjects like Christ in Islam, Is Jesus God? What the Bible says about Muhammad? Muhammad the greatest. Islam and Christianity is the Bible God's word. Was Christ crucified? And on and on. We
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الثنتكم والوانكم صدق الله صدق الله المولان عزيم My dear brothers and sisters, I have read to you a verse from Surah Rum. Rum. That is chapter 30 from the verse number 22. Surah Rum. You can find it in the Holy Quran, as I explained previously, through the index. Look for Rum, R-U-M, Rum, or chapter 30, verse 22. You can find this very easily. And in it, Allah Bari Ta'ala tells us that among his signs, wamin ayatihi, among his signs, the miracles of God's creation, khalqu samawati wal ardi, that is the creation of the heavens and the earth. These are his signs of a masterful creator. How the systems work. These are signs for a people of understanding in it. And waqtilafu and the variations, al sinatikum of your languages is also there are signs, the miracles of God's creation. In Dalika, in these are La Ayatil Lil Alameen are signs for a people of understanding, people of learning, people of wisdom. In these are signs for them of a masterful creator, of a wonderful creator. Now among these signs I'm going to deal with languages today. Languages. You see, languages, as Allah says, there are, are a miracle of God's creation. But they do not appear to us. So, we take things for granted, number one. Number two, when languages which we have not heard, which we have not experienced, they sound funny to us, they sound silly to us. And I was illustrating this point to an audience of mine in South Africa, in Cape Town, where most of the Muslims from Southeast Asia, from Malaysia and from Indonesia, they live. Some 300 years ago, they were taken there as prisoners of war, and they were sold to the white man in South Africa as slaves. Now, I was, this was my predominant audience of Malays. We call them Malays, the so-called Malays in South Africa. And I was illustrating to them that language is a miracle of God's creation. Different nations have different theories. We will not go into the other theories. But the Quranic fact, as given by Allah, is that this language is the creation of Allah. It is not your own invention. It's a miracle. And it is His miracle, His mojiza. So I said, now look, I'm speaking to you people English. Does it sound silly or funny to you? They said, no. It seems normal, natural. And they speak Afrikaans as a home language, so I gave a smattering of Afrikaans to them. I said, does that sound silly or funny to you? And they said, no, because they also use, they are most of the Muslims I'm talking about, they are bilingual, they speak English and Afrikaans equally well. Then I quoted them in Zulu. I said, Pegani is Angela Zami Nezion Zami, Ugutimi no Kobo. Gipateni nibone, goguba itongo, alina nyama na matambo, jangoguba nibona ginako. I said, does that sound silly or funny to you? But I said, what I want you to do, I'm going to give you samples from different languages. At the end of it, I'm going to ask you which is the silliest and funniest language of them all. So saying, I quoted them, this language I just read to you now, well, is Zulu. Then I quoted Swahili. Then I quoted them Indonesian, but they didn't know that I was quoting them Indonesian. So I said, Tengokla, Tanganku, Dan Kakiku, Inila Aku Sendiri, Jamahla Aku Dan Lihatla, Karena Hantu Tiada Barda Ging Dan Tulang, Saperti Yang Kamulahat Ada Padaku. And they all burst out laughing. It was a big joke. So I asked my audience, 
the packed city hall. I said, tell me now, which is the silliest and funniest language that I have recited to you so far? And they all voted for the last one, the Indonesian. So I said, shame on you. I'm telling my audience, shame on you. This is your mother tongue. How can you say that your language is the silliest and funniest of them all? So the reason is that for 300 years you didn't hear the language, your own language. You cut off from your motherland. 300 years, you never heard the language. And there are 10,000 miles away from where you are. No chance of hearing it. So to you now, your own mother tongue, because you didn't hear it, your people didn't hear it for 300 years, and 10,000 miles away from where you are now, that sounds to you like the silliest and funniest language of them all. But if it was your mother tongue, and if you knew your mother tongue, the Arab will never say Arabic is the silliest and the funniest. The Chinese, now man have it sounds tingling, but the Chinese will never say that his language is the silliest and the funniest. Each and everyone will testify that my language is the sweetest language of all languages. It is the best language of all languages. This is human nature. So, I have been using this. It is a beautiful illustration to show that languages are beautiful and they are miraculous. But to learn a foreign language, I find that my Arab brethren, the students, they find certain difficulties. Most especially when they go outside, they learn English grammar here before going to America for further studies or before going to Britain for further studies. They study grammar, they learn vocabulary. And when they land in that place, I was at a youth conference, students, Muslim students from all these foreign lands. And when they were questioned regarding the problems first year, the, what is the most serious problem that the student faces. So every student almost 100% said, number one, language. The first problem you are facing in the foreign lang uh, land is language. Second year, again, number one is still language. Third year, still problem number one is language. And from the third year onwards, the positions change. Your other problems might take priority. But language has been the foremost problem of the Arab when he goes outside. So I'm suggesting that, you know, there is a method of learning. And my method was, as, I, as you saw, I was using actually the Christian Bible. I know the Bible extensively in English. So what I do is I get a Bible in another language and I learn the verses that I already know. So it makes it doubly easy for me to learn. But now, am I going to suggest to the Arab that he goes and gets a Bible and learn it through the, my system? I said, no. You also have something similar in your hand, and that is the Holy Quran. What you do is, there are verses that you know by heart. And the students in Dahran University, I was suggesting to them that whether they know these Quranic verses, which I quoted to them. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So, wa is talatil malaika to ya Maryamu. Inna Allah has tafaki, wa taharaki, wa tafaki ala nisail alameen. I asked the students whether they knew this verse. And almost 100% they put up their hands as they knew. I said, are you all Hafiz al-Quran? They says, no. But somehow the Muslim seems to know the Quran quite extensively by heart without knowing that he's Hafiz. He's not a Hafiz al-Quran. He might not be able to read from one end to the other, but he knows so much here, there, there. So I said, now what you do is you take that verse. And you get a translation, an English translation, like this one. I was suggesting again and again, get this one. And learn the meaning side by side. Memorize the meaning. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah has tafaki, that God Almighty has chosen thee, was tafaki alani sail alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Memorize the English part now. And on and on. And when you have finished memorizing, Ya Maryam Muknuti, Le Rabbiki, Was Judi, Warka E, Maraka In. So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. Verse by verse. The Arabic you already know. If you haven't, brush it up. And the English, memorize the meaning. Now, once you do that, you will have endless opportunities of speaking these words to your fellow countrymen who are non Muslims, from America, from Britain, who speak English. He says, You know, we believe in Jesus. He says, Do you? Yes. He says, you know what the Quran says? He says, no. It says, and you start. Maryam. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, and on and on. So what you are doing now, you are rehearsing the signs of Allah, the words of Allah, and now you are translating it in English, and you are getting an opportunity of practicing. And I assure you, 
My dear brothers, there's endless blessings attached to that. Just the mere reading of the Tilawat the Quran is blessings. And now you're sharing it, your English will improve and you will have more and more confidence. So with this, I say, Wa akhirud da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In South Africa, where I come from, in that ocean of Christianity, we have to present Islam, as Allah Bari Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, say, so invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. And with beautiful preaching, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And this tartib, this method, this approach that we have developed in South Africa, which we believe is Quranic, speaking to a people according to their own background and experience. And the majority of the people we come across are people with a background of the Bible, what they say, the Holy Bible of the Christians, the Holy Bible, this is the background. So whenever we want to approach them, when we want to talk to them, they say, my Bible says this, or my Bible says that, my Bible says this, or my Bible says that. So, because of the knowledge of the Bible, they are, the bulk of the people, are one book professors. They all know only about the Bible. So, what we have to do, and which we are doing in South Africa, we have published books under the title, What the Bible Says About Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Christ in Islam, Jesus Christ in the house of Islam, what is his position? Now, we give references from the Holy Bible, the Christian Bible, which is common to both the Jews and the Christians. And we say, look, the Holy Prophet Muhammad was foretold in your own book. So they say, where? This we get our cue, our direction from the Holy Quran, where Allah says, He says, do they not see this book, the Quran, whether it be from Allah, and they disbelieve in it. When a witness from among the children of Israel, from the Bani Israel, bore witness of one like him. One like him. Now, who is this witness from among the Bani Israel who testified, who prophesied, who made basharat about the coming of our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They say, we haven't got anything like that in our book. This is a tall claim made by the Muslims. There's something in our book. There is nothing in our book. So we have to refer to them, and we refer to them in the first portion of the Bible called the Torah, the Pentateuch. There are five books attributed to the Holy Prophet Moses. This is not really the Torah, but the Christians and the Jews, they say, this is the Torah. We say in that fifth book of this five books, called the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, it says, I will raise them up a prophet. I, God Almighty talking, he said, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, like you, like Moses. وَشَهِدَ شَهِدٌ مِّن بَنِي إِسْرَيْلَ أَلَا مِثْلِهِ The Quranic verse. The Bible says, مِثْلَكَ It says, like unto thee, like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now we say, who is that prophet? Mithlaka, like you. And this verse, you know, when it is quoted in Arabic, in Arabic, from the Arabic Bible, produced by the Christians, from the Bible societies, we are able to buy these Bibles in a thousand different languages. I had to purchase one in Arabic to learn this, to see how does it read in Arabic. And I read it, and I learned it. It says, Uqimu lahum, I'm quoting the Bible now, that, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, Allah is saying, that when he, that prophet who comes, like Moses, speaking in my name, he said, I will require it of him. In the Catholic Bible, the words are stronger. He says, I will take revenge, vengeance from him. 
Allah bari ta'ala. In the Christian Bible, he's promising vengeance, revenge. Anybody who will not hearken unto my message, which that prophet will speak in my name, he says, I will take revenge. Now we ask, who is that prophet? So they say, Jesus. So we question, how is Jesus like Moses? And we present our case, and we have produced a booklet. The booklet that, who is this prophet like Moses? I show it to you. Here, this booklet here, which is what the Bible says about Muhammad. Here we give you the Quranic verse and the tafsir by using the Bible and show more than 15 different reasons why this prophecy, this basharat in the verse that I have quoted, that it does not refer to Jesus Christ, but it refers to the Holy Prophet Muhammad In that we do not mean, we do not claim, we do not say that Jesus was not the Messiah. We say he was the Messiah and there are a hundred prophecies about his coming. But this one in particular, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, refers to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and is that not, does not refer to Jesus. And it is doing a beautiful job. And this booklet is to be translated into the Zulu language, into the Afrikaans language. And we learn this, like for example, this very verse. I learned it in Arabic because I had a motive. And the motive was, long before this turmoil in Lebanon, I had an aspiration to go to Lebanon and speak to the Lebanese Christians. And if I could quote in Arabic, I, coming from South Africa, though I read the Quran and I am able to learn and memorize certain words and expressions which I am giving meaning from the translation, I do not know Arabic as a language, unfortunately. I am ashamed of it, that I do not know Arabic as a language. But when I quote this, to the respective language group in his language, in his mother tongue, I can see the impact that it has, which in a foreign language it doesn't hold. So I learned in Arabic with the idea of going to Lebanon and talking to the Arab Christians and proposing these verses to him and reasoning with them. In English, of course, I'll deliver my lecture, but quoting the verses in Arabic. Then I wanted to go to Israel, talking to the Jews, so I learned it in Hebrew. Amazing, you know. I learned it in Hebrew. It says, Navi Akim Lahim Mikarev Achayhim Kamochavi Natati. Before with the Bir, I quote it in Hebrew, I quote it in Afrikaans, I quote it in Zulu, I quote it in a dozen different languages. This is my hobby, my pastime, that whenever I go to a new country, I try to get a smattering of that language that I can win the hearts and minds of the people by delivering this message of Islam to them. So, in this verse, it says that prophet will come speaking in my name. And this is so beautifully demonstrated from the Quran. In this Quran especially, I open from the right at the end where we have all the small surahs. The small surahs of the Quran beginning, Kul Auzubir bin Nas, Kul Auzubir bil Falak, Kul Hu Allah, Tabbat Yada. And in this translation, every page is a new surah. And I open the page, for example, yeah, I open the page beginning with Surah Nas. Surah Nas. And so it begins. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Next page. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Next page. Bismillahir Rahman. Every, every chapter of the Holy Quran. From, begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. It's amazing. It's amazing that every chapter, every page from the end, if you start showing it to the Christian and the Jew, he said, Look, every page begins in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. And the Bible says, it will come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. In whose name is Muhammad speaking? He is speaking, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. And this is a fulfillment of a prophecy to the letter, to the T. And if we can only demonstrate to our fellow countrymen and our visitors and our tourists and our fellow workers, Inshallah, you will be able to do a job of work far more readily, far more effectively, if you can present the Quran to them. Wa akhirud da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen.
السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ In this ocean of Christianity, South Africa, where I come from, we are asked numerous questions. Like, for example, they would like to know what is the relationship between Islam and the other religions. We say, and rightly so, that Islam is not a new religion. It is actually a continuation of the teachings of Moses, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, and Jesus, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, brought to perfection. And in that, we say that Islam is Judaism made universal. We claim a unique relationship among the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. With them, we claim a unique relationship that Islam is Judaism made universal, is the teaching of Moses sallallahu alayhi made universal. The Jew says that God Almighty is absolutely unique. He has no partners, he has no sons. God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. And we give our hand of exceptions to the Jew that we believe as you believe. The Jew says, no eating of the flesh of swine. We say, we won't eat it. He says, no eating of blood. We say, we won't touch it. He says, no, sir, he says circumcision. We say, we are circumcised. What more do you want? We would say that Islam is Judaism made universal. And we also claim a unique relationship with the Christians in this that Islam is also uh, the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. We say that we believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, the Masih, translated Christ. We say we believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. A miracle of God. And we believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. The only real difference between us and the Jew is, we say, is political. With the Jew is political. The Muslim and the Jew are fighting for a piece of land. We say, my brother, the Arab, he says Palestine belongs to him. The Jew says Palestine belongs to him. Both my brothers and my cousins are fighting for a piece of land. It has something to do with politics. It has got nothing to do with race. It has got nothing to do with religion. I am speaking to my South African audience. This is how I present my case. With the Christian, we are the closest in what I have just mentioned now. His birth, his position, his status, his miracles. The only point of real difference is that we say he is not God Almighty in human form and he is not God incarnate and he is not the begotten son of God. These are the points of real difference. Otherwise, the Quran, the manner, the nobility in which it describes the birth of Jesus in the Holy Quran, Surah, in the Holy Quran, we read in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 42, so behold, the angel said, O Mary, that God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Ya Maryam Muknuti li Rabbiki was Judi Warka Imara Kain. So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. That this is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration and so on. In these verses, when it is read to them, to the non-Muslim, especially the Christian and more especially the Roman Catholic, an amazing thing happens. When we read the Quranic Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give its translation, the effect that it produces on the listener we see their eyes well up with tears. And they can't seem to believe their ears because they have been programmed from childhood into thinking, into believing that we Muslims are the antichrist, that we are the enemies of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. When we tell them that we believe in Jesus, we say that he was the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles. In my country, my people, the people who are ruling us, they are thinking that we are trying to curry favor with them. We are trying to be nice to them. That if we say a few good words about the Jesus, 
maybe they might say a few good words about our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is not the case which would be hypocrisy we have to show them the quran and we make them to see and we read it to them and explain to them and they bite the fingers metaphorically they bite the fingers says, look we were thinking that this was just the opposite and if they read this and i told them show them demonstrated to them that this birth of jesus as narrated in the holy quran is a nobler and a sublimer version of his birth than anything to be found anywhere because when this good news was given to mary we read in the holy quran she says says qadat rabbi anna yakunu li waladun wa lam yamsasni bashar she says oh my lord how shall i have a son when no man has touched me physically sexually in other words she had no relationship with any man and how is she going to have a child and the answers to that as we find in the holy quran so qala kadhalika allah yakhluqu ma yasha said even so allah creates what he wills wa iza qada amran whenever he decrees a matter fa inna ma yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun whenever he decrees a matter if he wants to do anything he merely wills it and the thing comes into being we said this is the muslim concept of the birth of jesus for god to create a jesus without a human father just like that if he wants to create a million jesuses without father and without mother just like that if he wants to create universes millions and billions of them just like that wa iza qada amran whenever he decrees a matter fa inna ma yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun he merely says to it be and it is now this we have not shared with our fellow countrymen in south africa it seems like a novel thing to them and rest of the world also we have failed miserably in presenting the quran to the unbeliever in south africa we have started translating this book into zulu the language of the majority of the sons of the soil the african there are some 7 million zulus in my part of the country 7 million the biggest number of people they are like what the quraish were in arabia these people are among the african the zulus so we have translated the quran into zulu we have translated the holy quran into afrikaans which is the language of the ruling race and this was all done by the help of the islamic uh, courts and affairs of doha qatar they helped us alhamdulillah and their help has gone to such great extent that we have been able to do all these things and i urge upon muslims everywhere that they take up the quran and read it to our brethren our fellow countrymen our visitors our tourists our uh, expatriates read it to them make it available available to them let them see the quran for themselves because they have some mysterious ideas mystic ideas about us they don't know what is happening in the masjids they don't know what we really stand for they don't know what the quran really says and this volume that the has been produced in your in your country here has been most useful because this one is a unique translation that this man yusuf ali abdullah yusuf ali allama yusuf ali uh, some 50 years ago he did this job and he has been able to arrange for us such fantastic system that you read the, the verse of the quran and you have the translation side by side so you can also the arab can also improve his english and a very comprehensive index at the back of the quran and this index puts everything on your fingertips anything you want to you know about jesus open j and in the jesus you'll find a dozen different references you want to know about moses under m you find moses you want to know about marriage about divorce everything on your fingertips you can refer to it in two ticks may allah bari taala you know make it possible for you to have access to this book of god and use it for the propagation of islam wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولن ترضى انك اليهود ولا النصارى حتى تتبع ملتهم صدق الله صدق الله مولانا العظيم my dear brothers and sisters on wednesday the 14th of march 1984 in your gulf times there was a beautiful cartoon and this cartoon portrayed 
the would-be president of the United States, a candidate, trying to reach the presidential seat, the White House. But in this cartoon, our brother, Ittihad, shows that any president of the United States has to pass through the Star of David, meaning the Jews. Without the Star of David, there is no success for any president or would-be president to the United States seat. Now, this Star of David represents the six million Jews in America, which forms what is called the Jewish lobby. Now, without the support of the Jewish lobby, no president can be ever elected to that seat. If they have the moral support and the vote support of the Jews, the president can be nominated. Now, the secret of this was revealed by President Truman in 1948, the power of the Jews. In 1948, Israel, this Jewish state in the Middle East, in the heart of the Muslim lands, in Palestine, they established a Jewish state. And within two minutes of the Declaration of Independence by Ben-Gurion, President Truman, he recognized Israel within two minutes. As if Truman, like a young man, a young groom, at his wedding ceremony, he was just prepared to say, when questioned, do you take this woman as your lawfully wedded wife? And he was waiting with open mouth just to say, I do. And within two minutes, President Truman did exactly that. He says, I do. I recognize Israel. Subsequently, a reporter, a newspaper man, meets Truman at a press conference and reminds him, he says, look, what was all the hurry for? You know, in due time, you could have recognized Israel like the rest of the uh, countries of the world. But why the hurry? You know, there are 100 million Arabs, and these 100 million Arabs will get offended with you. In answer to that, President Truman he said, he said, there are no Arabs in my constituency, meaning that no Arabs voted me into power. The people who vote me into power in my constituency are the Jews, so I have to placate the Jews. So the secret is you have, you need people in America to have that power of vote, what the Jews have, they have six million bulk vote. Now, how are we going to put six million Arabs into America? Because America will not allow that, except for a few brilliant brains of ours. Brain, brain, when they go for education, they like to keep them there, exploit them. But as workers, as laborers, or for any other reason, if you want to go there, most probably there are barriers which you can never overcome. So how are we going to get six million Arabs or Muslims or Pakistanis or Bangladeshis who might be sympathetic to us, our cause in America? Impossible. The only other way is that there are people in America whom, who are called the Afro-Americans. They are now being described as the Bilalians, the people of Hazrat Bilal. These Bilalians, these American Negroes, if we can have them converted to Islam, and I can assure my brothers and sisters that at a less cost than the price of a fighter plane, this thing can be done. If we are prepared to do, to do dawa work among the Afro-Americans, in less than the price of a fighter plane, we can have the six million to counterbalance the Jewish vote. But now, secondly, the Americans have been programmed, they have been brainwashed into believing that Palestine belongs to the Jews. Now, this sickness had been developed over a long period of time. And the manner in which it was developed was that this Christian Bible, which is the book of authority for the Christians, this Christian Bible 
more than two thirds of it, more than two thirds of this Bible is called the Old Testament by the Christians, which means everything before Jesus, which was the books of the Jews that the Christians have now owned up, they have inherited, and in that portion of the book called the Old Testament of the Holy Bible, they say that God Almighty had promised Palestine to the Jews. And they quote from the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, in which God Almighty is supposed to have told Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam that I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now from that, the Jews and the Christians have taken that God Almighty had promised Palestine to the Jews. But when we analyze this so-called prophecy, this is a prophecy, a basharat, which is supposed to happen. When we analyze it, we find that it is not true to history. Because if this is the word of God, and if God Almighty had promised it to Abraham, that I will give unto thee, to you, O Abraham, and to thy seed after thee, meaning your children, all the land of Canaan. In actual fact, when we read the book of Genesis at the end, we find that when Abraham died, his sons Ismail and Ishaq went to bury the father, Abraham. But when they went to bury him, there was not land. They didn't have land to bury the father. So they went and bought a piece of land sufficient to bury the father. And the Bible says, this book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it says, and Abraham didn't have enough land to rest his foot upon. In other words, this was not the promise of God. But even if we accept it as such, what does it say? It says, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, who is the seed of Abraham? When we ask this to the Christians, they say the Jews. When we ask the Jews, they say we, we are the seed of Abraham. But are not the Bani, Israel, Bani Ismail, the children of Ismail, are they not his seed? In this very first book of the Jewish and the Christian Bible, in the book of Genesis, that is the first book, no less than 12 places we read. In chapter 16 of Genesis, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, he pours out a prayer. And in that prayer, he's asking Allah bari ta'ala that Ismail, his firstborn, his son, may Allah give him long life and health and prosperity. So Allah says, according to the Bible, he said, I will, as, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, means I have heard your prayer. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, because he is thy seed. Somewhere else again in the same book, and as for Ishmael thy son, and again as for Ishmael thy seed, no less than 12 places in the so-called Torah of the Jews, which is this first book of the Bible, which is the first book of uh, Genesis, no less than 12 places Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam is referred to as the son and seed of Abraham. So, if he is also the son and seed of Abraham, why should they be deprived of this privilege of living in their own motherland, in their own hearts and homes. But now, since the Christian has been programmed and the Jews has been programmed, we have to deprogram them, reprogram them. And without this reprogramming, we have not taken the trouble to discuss this matter among the Christians, to show them the anomaly of their position, that what you are claiming that this land belongs to the Jews, in actual fact, it does not belong to the Jews. How did the Jews become possessors of the land? We know that in history, when they came out un by Hazrat, under Hazrat Musa salam from Egypt and uh, under Joshua, they went and conquered the land by force of arms. And by force of arms, if one nation conquers another, how does it entitle that nation to have the moral rights to such a property. So it is something that we have not done and because of the lack of uh, response on our part to reprogram, to put our case forward to the Jews and the Christians, we are, you know, suffering more than what we ought to. Wa dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.
adjoining the Juma Masjid Durban are the offices of the Islamic Propagation Center International. The center began its modest activities in 1958, over 25 years ago, with one dingy office. In time, the center was forced to acquire two more offices. Now, with warehouses facilities in three different places, it is finding all its facilities still inadequate. The Poor Bandar Madrasa Trust, a charitable organization, has taken pity on our plight and has set in motion a plan to build a quarter million rand project in the mosque square next to the Juma Masjid itself. From printing and publishing pamphlets and booklets on Islam, the Islamic Propagation Center has reached the 100,000 target for each of its publications as a first print. From booklets and cassette tapes, the center has now ventured into the video field. The center can boast a unique distinction of offering more than 20 different video programs on Islam, which sad to say, no Muslim country in the world can offer. Subjects like Christ in Islam, is Jesus God? What the Bible says about Muhammad? Muhammad the greatest. Islam and Christianity is the Bible God's word. Was Christ crucified? And on and on. We urge every Muslim who own a video machine to create a library of our world-class video tapes and make his home a miniature TV station of Islam and inviting his Muslim and non-Muslim friends to see them. May Allah reward you in all your sincere efforts in propagating his deed. Amen. Write today for our free Islamic literature on comparative religion. Address